The economic relationship between Canada and India is of ever-increasing strategic importance. Both nations boast democracies, diverse economies, and have strong private sectors that can do so much more together. Today, you will hear insights from some of the most preeminent Indian and Canadian business and government leaders on the future of the Canada-India Economic Corridor. Canada has been attentive to diversifying its economic interests. Recent trade and investment numbers show a clear uptick in the bilateral relationship. And if we can accelerate further, there will be shared prosperity in the longer term for both countries. The speakers who are with us today are extraordinary leaders in business and government. All of them have experience in the Canada-India space. Their insights will help us in shaping actionable strategies. And we at the Canada-India Business Council are committed to play our part in implementing their recommendations. The Canada-India Business Council, Fairfax Financial Holdings Limited, the High Commission of India to Canada, the High Commission for Canada to India, IIFL, Invest in Canada, and all of our valued sponsors are honoured to welcome you to Invest India 2020. Good morning to everyone joining us from across Canada and good evening to those tuning in from India. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to Invest India 2020. What a rare opportunity to have so many binational leaders of such high caliber come together on one platform. As a result, we have people participating from coast to coast to coast in Canada and right throughout India. For 38 years, the Canada India Business Council has served the needs of businesses working in this economic corridor. And amidst a global pandemic, we have no choice but to reimagine new ways of collaborating. And there's no time like the present to innovate and expand on what we can do together. We are here today to increase bilateral trade and bilateral investment between these two great countries. We need to lock in and strengthen Canada's connection to what is forecasted for years to come as the world's fastest growing large economy. India. Canada and India need to be ready to do so much more together. And as a result, today is special because we are going to hear directly from the Prime Minister of India, our amazing High Commissioners. We're going to hear how India is transforming. We're going to hear about the digital opportunities that lie ahead. We're also going to get insights into how some of Canada's largest funds are assessing the Indian market. And we then get to hear from four extraordinary private sector chairs on their unique perspective on opportunities for Canada and India. We would not be here today without our generous sponsors who have helped us make this virtual conference possible. And I thank you. There is no bigger supporter and sponsor of this conference than our conference chair, Prem Watsa. He is chairman and CEO of Fairfax Financial Holdings Limited. He is the chancellor of Huron University College at, Uni at the University of Western Ontario and was a former chancellor of the University of Waterloo. He was also on the boards of the Bank of Ireland and ICICI Bank. He serves as a board member on numerous charities. He is a recipient of the Order of Canada and is a recipient of the Padma Shri Award in India. I can easily sum it up by calling him Mr. India in Canada. Please welcome Prem Watsa. Thank you very much, uh, Victor. And let me begin with a warm welcome to all the attendees and participants to the third Invest India conference. It promises to be a terrific one with a superb lineup of speakers from both India and Canada. We have an exciting conference to look forward to in a virtual setting. The purpose of this conference is to promote trade and investment between our two countries. We are very honored and excited to have the Honorable Sri Narendra Modi to open this conference with his inaugural address. India changed six years ago when Mr. Modi became Prime Minister. Winning with a majority 
and implementing his business-friendly policies. Last year, Mr. Modi, based on what he has done for the common man and woman in India, won by an even greater majority. Mr. Modi said that the man who never had electricity in his house would not forget him in the elections, and that the woman who never had gas for cooking would vote for him in the elections. And he was right. What the Honorable Mr. Modi has done for the common man is truly amazing. I have publicly said Mr. Modi is the Lee Kuan Yew of India, and his challenge is even greater as he is dealing with a population of 1.3 billion people. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Modi has a goal of doubling GDP from two and a half trillion to five trillion dollars in the next five years. He has provided economic freedom, economic freedom for all Indians. I have had the honor of meeting him many times over the last six years, and I can tell you, I have never met a man so passionately focused on developing India. India is being transformed by Mr. Modi, and in my mind, is the best country in the world for investments in common shares and in plant and equipment and infrastructure. Without further ado, let's welcome the Honorable Mr. Narendra Modi, the Prime Minister of India. Mr. Modi. My dear friends, Namaste. First of all, I would like to compliment Sri Prem Bhats for creating this forum. It is good to see so many investors and businesses of Canada here. I am glad you are being exposed to the tremendous investment and business opportunities in India. Friends, there is one thing common to most people in the audience. It has people who take investment decisions. Decisions which assess risk. Decisions which predict return while making investment. I want to ask you, what do you think about before investing in any country? Does the country have a vibrant democracy? Does the country have political stability? Does the country have investment in business-friendly policies? Does the country have transparency in governance? Does the country have a skilled talent pool? Does the country have a large market? These are different questions you may be asking. The undisputed answer to all these questions is one, and that is India. There is an opportunity for everyone, institutional investors, manufacturers, supporters of innovations, ecosystems, and infrastructure companies. There is an opportunity to invest, to set up units, and to run businesses. There is an opportunity to partner with our private sector and with the government. There is an opportunity to earn as well as learn. Not only that, as well as to lead. There is an opportunity to grow. Friends, in the post-COVID world, you will often hear of various kinds of problems. Problems of manufacturing, problems of supply chains, problems of PPV, etc. Problems are natural. However, India had not let those problems be. We showed resilience and emerged as a land of solutions. We provided free food grain to 800 million people and free cooking gas to around 80 million families. 
and for a long time despite disrupted logistics we are able to deliver money directly into bank accounts of more than 400 million farmers women poor and needy people within a matter of days this shows the strength of governance structure and systems that we have built over the last few years friends india is playing the role of the pharmacy to the world we have provided medicine to around 150 countries so far during this pandemic during march june of this year our agriculture export rose by 23% this happened while the entire country was stringent lockdown today our manufacturing is running on full stream before the pandemic india hardly manufactured pp kits today not only does india manufactures millions of pp kits every month it also exports them we are also committed to ramping up production we want to help the entire world when it comes to vaccine production for covid-19 friends the india story is strong today and stronger tomorrow let me explain how today the fdi regime has been very well liberalized we have created a friendly tax regime for sovereign wealth and pension funds we have undertaken significant reforms for developing a robust bond market we have come up with incentive schemes for champion sectors schemes in sectors like in pharma medical devices and electronic manufacturing have already been in operation we want to ensure high level attention and effective hand holding for investors for this a dedicated empowered group of secretaries has been made we are proactively monetizing assets across sectors airports railways highways power transmission lines so many real estate investment trust and infrastructure investment trusts have been fully enabled for monetization of both public and private assets friends today india is undergoing a rapid change in mindset as well as markets today india has embarked on a journey of deregulation and decriminalization of various offenses under the companies act india has risen from 81 to 48 in the global innovation index rankings in the last 5 years india has risen 142 to 63 in the world bank's ease of doing business ranking in last 5 years the result of these improvements are there for everyone to see india received around 70 billion us dollar from institutional investors in a year and a half between january 2019 july 2020 this is almost equal to that received in 4 years between 2013 and 
द कंटिन्यू कॉन्फिडेंस ऑफ ग्लोबल इन्वेस्टर कम्युनिटी इन इंडिया इज सीन बाय द फैक्ट दैट एफ डी आई इन इन टू इंडिया वेंट अप बाय ट्वेंटी परसेंट इन ट्वेंटी नाइनटीन एंड दिस वेन ग्लोबल एफ डी आई इन फ्लोज फेल बाय वन परसेंट इंडिया हैज ऑलरेडी रिसीव ओवर ट्वेंटी बिलियन यू एस डॉलर ड्यूरिंग द फर्स्ट सिक्स मंथस ऑफ दिस ईयर फ्रॉम अक्रॉस द ग्लोब दिस इज ऑल्सो द टाइम वेन कोविड नाइनटीन हैज बीन एट पीक ग्लोबली द इंटरनेशनल फाइनेंशियल सर्विसेज सेंटर एट गिफ्ट सिटी इज वन ऑफ अवर मेजर इनिशिएटिव इन्वेस्टर कूड यूटिलाइज इट एज ए प्रेफर्ड प्लेटफॉर्म ट्रांजेक्ट ग्लोबली वी हैव रिसेंटली सेटअप ए फुल एम्पावर्ड यूनिफाइड रेगुलेटर फॉर इट फ्रेंड्स इंडिया हैज अडोप्टेड ए यूनिक अप्रोच पोज बाय द कोविड नाइन्टीन पेंडेमिक वी हैव गिवन रिलीफ एंड स्टिम्युलस पैकेज फॉर द पुअर and the small businesses but we have also used this opportunity to undertake structural reforms these reforms ensure more productivity and prosperity india has undertaken a trinity of reforms in the field of education labor and edu- agriculture together they impact almost every indian india has ensured reforms of old laws in the field of labor and agriculture they ensure greater participation of the private sector while also strengthening the government safety nets these reforms will lead to a win win situation for entrepreneurs as well as for our hard working people the reforms in the field of education will further harness the talent of our youth these reforms have also set the stage for more foreign universities to be able to come to india the reforms in the labor laws greatly reduce the number of labor codes they are both employee and employer friendly and will further increase ease of doing businesses the reforms in the field of agriculture are far reaching they will not only give more choice to farmers but will boost exports these reforms will support our efforts to build an atmanirbhar bharat or self reliant india by working towards self reliance we seek to contribute to global good and prosperity friends if you are looking to partner in the field of education the place to be is india if you are looking to invest in manufacturing for ser- or services the place to be is india if you are looking to collaborate in the field of agriculture the place to be is india friends india canada bilateral ties are driven by our shared democratic values and many common interests the trade and investment linkages between us are integral to our multifaceted relationship canada is the 20th largest foreign investor in india more than 600 canadian companies have presence in india i am told that canadian pension funds have pledged around 50 billion us dollars as investment in india till now our relationship is perhaps far stronger than what the number suggests but that also means together we can achieve much more canada is home to some of the 
largest and most experienced in infrastructure investors. Canadian pension funds were the first ones to start investing directly in India. Many of them have already discovered great opportunities in a range of areas like highways, airport, logistics, telecom, and real estate. They are looking at expanding their presence and finding new areas to invest. Mature Canadian investors who have been in India for many years now can be our best brand ambassadors. Their own experience, their plan to expand and diversify can be the most credible evidence for all of you to come here too. In addition, you have the benefit of knowing India well. After all, Canada has one of the largest Indian diaspora in the world. There would be no barriers for you here. You would find yourself as welcome here as in your own country. Thank you for inviting me to address this event. Thank you once again. Thank you. It is my special privilege to deliver the vote of thanks at this inaugural session of Invest India 2020 conference. I would like to express our profound gratitude to the Honorable Prime Minister, C. Narendra Modi ji, for delivering a truly inspiring and energizing inaugural address. We are thankful to him for taking time off his busy schedule. His presence in the conference is the greatest encouragement and boost to the international investors, particularly from Canada and North America, looking at investment opportunities in India. As usual, his clarity of thinking and emphasis on action was manifest in his speech. We are indeed fortunate and proud to have a visionary leader like him who has relentlessly worked in the last six years to make the economy open, digital, competitive, investor-friendly, inclusive for masses and nurturing innovation and transparency. I also take this opportunity to thank Mr. Prem Vassa, Fairfax, Canada India Business Council and Office of High Commissioner of India and Canada for excellent organization of Invest India Conference despite COVID crisis. While Prime Minister has set the tone, two and a half hours are packed with who's who of Indian business and Canadian investors. I also welcome and thank all distinguished speakers and participants without whose involvement this conference would not have been possible. I wish the conference a great success. Thank you. Good morning, good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to offer up some remarks at Invest India 2020. Once again, a huge uh, acknowledgement to Canada India Business Council for putting this together uh, to Prem Watsa for his leadership and your team at Fairfax for making this happen once again this year. And uh, a huge uh, acknowledgement to my counterpart uh, and colleague, His Excellency Ajay Bisaria, India's High Commissioner in Canada. Always great to work together to showcase the opportunities for investors in both Canada and India. Let me just start off by sharing one thing that has been constant at every Invest India conference that I've spoken at, which is all of them uh, to date. And that is the momentum in our commercial relationship continues to hit record numbers across the board. 2019 was no different. Uh, Two-way trade in goods eclipsed uh, $11.5 billion in services, another $3 billion on top of that. Uh, record numbers in terms of economic impact of students studying in Canada, of tourism, pre-pandemic, of course, uh, and every other number you can think of. But of course, most significantly is the total stock of investment both ways, which now is estimated to be in the neighborhood of $70 billion. Uh, and that's FDI, portfolio investment, both ways combined, significant growth. If you take the total of all of those numbers together, our commercial relationship is well over $80 billion and is well on its way to hitting $100 billion in the coming years. Now we want to leverage that momentum. And the pandemic, of course, has brought challenges. That said, 
As a result of these challenges, there has never been a more important time for India and Canada to work together to ensure that we do whatever is necessary for Canadian investors and Indian investors and companies that are active both ways to succeed, to continue to thrive in both markets. Um, we are focused on adapting some of the work that we do. Uh, we want to ensure that those Canadian investors that are here in India have the tools at their disposal. They have us to help guide them through any challenges uh, with a focus on the next 12 to 18 months so we could in, emerge on the other side successfully. And for those investors from India that are in Canada, we are here to continue to help you navigate the pandemic challenges but also grow so that you can continue to thrive in Canada as well. And our governments are in close contact on a regular basis. Our agriculture ministers collaborated at an event a couple of nights ago. Our trade ministers did a couple of weeks ago. Uh, there is ongoing keenness on both sides to do more together. And the pandemic, of course, is amplifying that as well. The pandemic is allowing us to take advantage of new opportunities where we can collaborate together in terms of sectors. For example, healthcare. Uh, we're looking at where, ways which we could collaborate on vaccine development, biotechnology, medical devices, infrastructure, as an example. So we're, we're adapting our role as diplomats and high commissioners to ensure that all of you as investors will continue to succeed. And I know that you will succeed because from the very beginning, pre-pandemic and through the pandemic, your outlook was always long-term and it continues to be a long-term outlook. The long-term outlook for uh, opportunities and success here and in India remain uh, here and in Canada remain very very positive and uh, we look forward to supporting your ongoing growth. My message to you today as participants if you are a Canadian investor or company active in India let us know if we can help in any way we are adapting our work to ensure that we work with you uh, to uh, ensure the success of your investments or your commercial uh, deals. If you're not in India and you're a Canadian uh, investor, come talk to us about how we can help navigate uh, and provide briefings or any other support that we can. If you're an Indian investor in Canada, let us know if we can help with your success and your growth. And if you're not in Canada and you're an Indian company or an investor, Canada must be on your top list of strategic countries of interest. We bring so much to the table in terms of talent, in terms of capital, in terms of favorable tax rates, a favorable environment that can take advantage of tr free trade agreements around the world. Come talk to us about the advantages of investing in Canada and we'll be there for you. With that said, I wish all the distinguished speakers at this conference huge success and for all the participants, thanks for listening. I hope you take something very special out of today and uh, we look forward to working with you well into the future. Thank you very much. All the best for a successful conference. I'm delighted to welcome all distinguished participants to this exclusive conversation on the India opportunity. First off, thank you Fairfax and Canada India Business Council for putting this together, even in the midst of a global crisis. We should be out of the woods next year, and I think it's important to look at a longer term perspective. I've had the opportunity to speak this year to a large number of business leaders across Canada. My one big takeaway from Canadian companies already active in India has been the strong assertion of confidence in the medium term prospects of the Indian economy. India and Canada declared a strategic partnership when Prime Minister Modi visited Canada in 2015. The headline of this partnership has clearly been the tenfold increase in Canadian portfolio investment in India from $5 billion to over $50 billion, led by champions of India such as Prem Vatsa. This is patient capital, in for the long run. It has supported key sectors like infrastructure, logistics, energy, real estate. This investment is growing and symbolizes, I think, Canada's faith in the India story. In India, we value this investment deeply. It is a vote of confidence in the transformative reforms being planned and rolled out even during the pandemic. Our stimulus package for the Indian economy came embedded with next generation economic reforms across the board in land, labor, laws, in health, agriculture, education. All this is reinforced by a 
strong acceleration towards a digital future which will help India leapfrog to the front lines of technology. Most importantly, I think this is an India listening carefully to its partners. We have shown great policy flexibility in response to the feedback from investors. Our Prime Minister is personally committed to nurturing these investments. This nimble policy ecosystem will keep the investment climate friendly, whether in tax regimes or regulatory systems. With Canada, we also hope to work out soon a bilateral investment protection agreement and perhaps even a limited trade agreement. India has now signaled an unwavering commitment to multilateralism, globalization, global supply chains, and global partnerships. In the next decades, India will remain a hub for digital growth, for innovation, for skills, for startups, while remaining committed to democracy, rule of law, transparency, diversity. India's rise to prosperity will be peaceful and inclusive, opening up multiple opportunities for our partners. I look forward to hearing from our eminent speakers today. Thank you.